Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this is a really special opportunity. I hope you will all enjoy immensely hearing a conversation between Sonia Boyce and Emma Ridgway. Um, Sonia probably needs no introduction, really. Sonia was uh, the winner of this year's Golden Lion for her presentation in the British Pavilion in Venice. Um, it was a landmark Venice and one that we were very proud to be supporting. And Emma Ridgway was the Shane Aykroyd curator responsible for working very closely with Sonia on the installation, which was a wonderful tour de force. So I, I don't want to hesitate too much, um, too many words, because hopefully your words will be more... Um, interesting and enlightening. Um, so I hand over to both of you um, for a conversation. You've already got microphones. We are mic'd, yes. Super. Okay, well, thank you both so much for being here. Thank oh, you, Sonia. Yeah. It's wonderful good to have to you. you. It's good to see you too. Great. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you so much. Um, so I'm Emma Ridgway, and it's been my great pleasure to work closely with the wonderful Sonia Boyce on the British Pavilion Commission for 2022. I'll speak for just one minute to give a very short overview of Sonia's career. So Sonia Boyce, O-B-E-R-A, pioneered a new place in art history for black British female subjectivity. And she was a key figure in the black British art movement of the 1980s. Her early drawings and collages reflected her own experience of gender and race as part of the Afro-Caribbean diaspora in Britain. And a number of these works early on were collected by the national collections, including Tate and Arts Council, British Council. And as you know, many artists, when they have such early success, stay with one identifiable style through their life. Yet Sonia has really sought new means of expression throughout her career. And since the 1990s, she's engaged many collaborators and she now works in photography and sound, video and installation, and wallpaper is something that runs throughout her work too. And a constant thread across four decades of her work are her thought-provoking depictions of intimate social encounters. So to start, I'd just ask Sonia, would you please just tell us a couple of pivotal moments for you as an artist so far? Okay, thank, thanks, Emma, and also thanks, Catherine. Um, so uh, we, we have some prepared questions, though we don't, I don't have the prepared answers, so to speak. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about this question of, of key moments um, as an artist, and I do have to go back to the late 70s when I was a, a student on Foundation. Um, foundation I did was here in London, in East Ham, so I grew up largely in East London. And uh, on my foundation course, it was a brilliant foundation course, actually, much of the, most of my tutors were very much interested in conceptual art. And we had a really very good art history tutor who introduced us all on our foundation course to um, early feminist art practice. And it was at that moment that I kind of, I, I suppose I wasn't really sure before um, this particular lecture, I was just kind of enjoying being on the course, and I'm seeing some of this early feminist work, British feminist practice, I decided this is what I want to do, this is the kind of, you know, this, it just was like a kind of light bulb, really, that one could make work about one's um, current conditions, about one's times in some way. So that was a very important moment. Um, uh, and I've been also thinking about... Um, again, that early period, um, and you know, writers like John Berger's Ways of Seeing, which was, um, and I'm sure many of us have had to read or watch that series that was on television or read his writings, and I dip into his writings often, actually, um, and the way in which he kind of introduced us to this idea of deconstructing the language of art, which I think has been really very important for how I've kind of viewed art practice. So I do, I kind of dip into looking at John Berger quite often. Um, when I was on my foundation, when I was on my degree course, I went to a place in Stourbridge in the West Midlands, very small, very small town, very small art college. And um, my main tutor 
was David Bainbridge, who was one of the founders of art and language. So in terms of like a kind of conceptual model of thinking about art, um, it's kind of run through my early um, art practice. And then the, the next, and, and during, during, while I was on, on, on my uh, fine art course, I, I became aware and introduced to a, a group called the Black Art Group, who had organized, um, one had, they'd organized an exhibition in Wolverhampton, which was back in 1981, I think. Uh, and then uh, organize a, a very important uh, conference called the First National Convention of Black Artists at Wolverhampton. It was Wolverhampton Poly at that point, but it's now the university. Um, and, and there I really became very aware of that one could talk about race as much as gender. So those were really, for me, quite the key moments. And then very lastly, I was thinking about um, uh, Jermaine Tawadras, who's about, as people may know, is about to become the new director of the Whitechapel. And when this would have been in the early 90s, mid 90s, Jermaine came to um, do a series of interviews with me and did my first monograph. And um, it was Jelaine who introduced me to the work of Lydia Clark and some of the discussions about kind of social practice. And social practice really took off for you in so many different directions through the decades that kind of followed the 90s on. And to talk more about your British Pavilion Commission, can we rewind to just to 2020? Would you speak to us about that there's a brilliant central concept that came to you initially, which is when we um, started working together, which you'd had the concept already of inviting singers into an improvised jamming session. Yeah, I mean, actually, the, the very, very first idea, because um, I, I kind of got the call at the end of um, 2019, so even, even longer, um, it feels. Um, and my first... The first thing I wanted to do was to, because I've been doing lots of things with performers and with, um, with audiences, I wanted to originally um, create a, an environment within the pavilion where um, the, entire, the entire site became an instrument that, that audiences could come and play. Mm -hmm because I've been thinking very much about how play is very important to, um, not only to, to, the, to how the work has been developing, but for adults as well to be able to play. But then, of course, COVID hit. And so by, by um, the spring of uh, 2020, I um, realized that it wasn't going to be possible to do something that would involve everybody being so kind of close together all the time it, for that period of, you know, dur the duration of the Biennale of six months. And so I, I, I then reverted back to a project that I've been working on for over 20 years uh, called the Devotional Project, which is a, a, a project that began in Liverpool back in 1999 um, and basically has enlisted the, the information from the general public mainly about a history of black British female singers originally, uh, though it's, it's widened to include um, other women in the music, British music industry, like composers and um, DJs and um, even music broadcasters. Um, so I reverted back to that project, which I've made lots of works from over the last 20 odd years, and thought, well, okay, let's, let's, let's start with something steady that I'm, I kind of know. And um, because throughout the, these 20 odd years that I've been working on this project, at various points I've, I've brought people in to kind of, act, you could say, activate the archive that has been um, developing as a consequence of, of all of the names that have been gathered. And, and of course, as a consequence of that, some of the memorabilia that people have given to me or I've brought myself. And I thought, well, yeah, I've worked, I've worked with with. with, with people before with this collection and I would really like to, I mean, the fantasy that I'd had for quite a while was to, to kind of um, build my own uh, female band. Um, and so the idea was then to approach singers because I thought it would be really great to work with singers and to get them to sing in some way. 
And it's useful as part of understanding this project to appreciate how uniquely dynamic your artistic process is. So you titled the exhibition Feeling Her Way. Well, we were quite far through the process in some ways to reflect the intuitive way that one part of the project leads to the next and leads to the next as you feel your way along. So rather than there being like a pre-planned vision or idea that's then enacted, would you talk a bit about the process, um, for example, with the video works? So, uh, yeah, what we, what, because there was a list of about 10, particularly by the time you, um, Emma had come on board, there was a list of about 10 performers that I wanted to kind of maybe work with. And uh, that kind of, uh, because of all sorts of commitments that other people had, um, who felt that they could go on this un, unscripted, because most of my projects are pretty much unscripted before they begin, um, process. And eventually there were five, uh, five musicians that said that they would be prepared to work with me. That's um, Erin Wallen, who's a composer, particularly a composer for voice. Uh, there's Poppia Judah, who's quite young, um, kind of R&B, soul singer. Um, there's Jackie Dankworth, who has been performing for many, many years. She's got extraordinary range of voice. Um, uh, and Tanita Tikaram, who many people will remember from the 80s at least, in terms of her, her, the fame that she achieved in, in the pop charts. Um, and also a, a fantastic experimental vocalist called Sophia Jernberg. And what, you know, whenever I'm doing a lot of the projects that I do, where I kind of bring people together, uh, it's, it's, it's very important that I am not, uh, I'm not telling them what to do. Um, and so I will say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna meet in such and such a place. Uh, we, we did manage to have one session on Zoom where they got to meet each other. Uh, and of course, these things always bring up lots of anxieties, or who else is gonna be part of this project? What are we going to do? Um, and I couldn't really say what we were going to do, but that we were going to be meeting at Abbey Road Studios uh, and that there'd be a, we'd have a day there where hopefully they might improvise and sing together. Um, and so it's very important in all of the projects that I do that once people have been, you know, who's confirmed is going to take part, uh, that there's a film crew that comes on board. And I've been working with uh, a filmmaker, Michelle Tofi, for the last... 10, over 10 years now. Um, she brings together a crew. I don't tell the crew what to do. I don't tell Michelle what to do. I don't tell the performers what to do. I just say, we have this space and this time, and you know we would like you to, to sing, but you, you do what you want in this space, and we'll record it. And luckily, um, because of course that's quite a gamble, um, Erilyn had said when I spoke to her, oh, you know, I could come in and I could kind of maybe lead the singers. And actually, the film, the, there's a four-part film in the first gallery at the pavilion, and um, the, that, that film is of the first half hour that they only just met, and Erilyn said, okay, kind of almost like as warm-up exercises got them to kind of um, play a bit with their voices until it kind of reach, reaches a kind of crescendo. Now, it has to be said that when I work like this, you know, bring people together and, you know, that people kind of figure out what they're going to do in, in a space. And usually they, it's always very nervous at the beginning. People kind of look at each other like, what are we supposed to be doing? But then once something begins, it's kind of, you know, very quickly there's, there's a kind of um, energy that kind of builds where people kind of negotiate their, what they know how to do with others. And so that's kind of what happened mm. um, on, that, on that day, um, is that they, they were able to come together and create extraordinary uh, sounds together. And then in the afternoon with, with, with Jackie, with Poppy and with Sunita, we, they, the invitation was also that if they wanted to do something of their own, that we would film them doing that. Um, unfortunately, Sophia wasn't able to join us because of all the travel restrictions um, that were in place uh, last summer. And so what we did was used a, uh, one of the filmed performances by Jackie and sent that to Sophia for her to improvise in a, a response to. So I kind of call that, that particular work a kind of duet, but that it was very remote in terms of they weren't in the same space at the same time. Thanks. 
Um, and one of the things through the exhibition as well, so it sort of, it very much started conceptually, as we just talked about, with this exploration that happened in Abbey Road Studios. And then it's on your collage and played around with the material, essentially. And because your work's conceptually strong, often that material aspect of your work isn't so much discussed. And the collage and print that's so big in your early work, it actually comes through in this installation as well. Would you speak mm. a little about that material side of your practice? Yes, I mean, you know, one of... I mean, in a way, collage happens across um, me working with people and, you know, what comes out of it. Because I, I suppose what I didn't say after, after I... I I, uh, the performances take place and they're documented and I don't, I usually don't, I did look through the camera at Abbey Road Studios but I prefer not to because I actually want to then see afresh what other people have documented from the day. I then, uh, I then edit films, I then make, um, remake images and re reconstruct images out of what has been given to me by others. So it's very much, it's very, that's really quite important that they get to play and then I get to play with the material. Um, I mean, you mentioned, Emma, that um, I've, I've been interested in wallpaper. I've been interested in wallpaper since I was on my degree course back in the early 80s. And it's something that just kind of constantly weaves through my practice. Um, not always, well, more and more intentionally now, uh, I think, to begin with, it was it, it became a kind of staple, um, but now I've kind of got to that point where I'm uh, since the 90s actually I've been making my own wallpapers. Um, of course, very much influenced by artists like William Morris or, or Andy Warhol, uh, Abigail Lane. That this idea of somehow taking something that may appear quite chaotic and trying to bring bring it back into some order. So for me. The, the making of these, um, the edited films and the making of wallpapers and, and again, the making of the sculptures or bringing the materials together is a, is a way for me to kind of um, harness the chaos that I kind of encourage to take place and then to try and bring it back into order. And of course, you know, for me, uh, and I mentioned this to you before, um, Emma, that it was only during the installation of the exhibition that was took place from about between January and March this year, that I really understood that for me a lot of the exhibition is about print. It's about print in terms of not only the wallpapers and um, uh, the memorabilia that is collected in, in in gallery floor is very much about print. But the whole show for me is about print in many ways, and this is a very you know, we could go into kind of talking about the question of the archive and memory and how print kind of holds memory in all kinds of ways. Mm. Um, but yeah, the material aspect of the work is very, um, is as significant as the kind of performative element of the work um, that I, yeah, I'm trying to think through how to bring it back into some kind of order. Mm. Wonderful. And just a final question, which is to revisit that heart leaping moment when the British Pavilion Exhibition Feeling Her Way was announced as the premier Golden Lion Award winner. And clearly at that moment we were sitting actually next to each other, quite close to each other, when Grand Bretagne was announced. That was the first time we heard also. And then our individual names were called up to go up to the stage and receive the award. And there were some very emotional speeches that ensued at that point. And it's so wonderful, Sonia, uh, that you're awarded the Golden Lion. And would you share with us how you were feeling at that moment and the way that you're feeling now? Um, I, I think my stomach just kind of fell out um, and just kind of... Um, I couldn't... I, because I didn't quite understand what was going on in the ceremony... I, I, was, I was actually very confused. Neither of us speak Italian, so... Yeah. Um, and, and I... So I was, I was like... I literally was like, what's going on? What's going on? We were, um, we were doing a lot of that, weren't we? Um, so, yeah, my, I think my first reaction was confused and, and just kind of like, wow. Um, and so, I, yeah, I was... I think part of me was kind of chaotic and then it's like, pull yourself together. 
um, and, and get, get up or walk to the stage, if you can put one foot in front of the other and, 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 and then go and say something. Um, so it was, it, it, was, it was really a shock because I don't think... I don't think I'd... One, I haven't seen very much of the Biennale. So there was very little way to gauge mm-hmm. what else... It, you know, the work was being seen in relation to. Um, and of course, you know, immensely proud of the show and the work yourself, everybody that was involved in making it happen. Uh, but then I kind of thought, wow, that, that was unexpected. That was, you know... Uh, and then, of course, you know, realising subsequently that, OK, so... In, this is for the exhibition itself, but it's probably also for kind of 40 years of work at the same time. That it's a kind of, his, it's, it's a kind of, it's a marker not only of, of, of this pavilion, but the, all, all the work that has been kind of taking place in the last 40 years. So, it, you know, incredibly, you know, um, felt incredibly honoured. And I, I went and shook everybody's, literally everybody's hand. There may have been some people who had nothing to do with the decision, but I went and shook everybody's hand, kind of thanking them. Um, subsequently, lots and lots of people who, and people have been, you know, there's been an outpouring of such generosity um, and goodwill. Um, and in those conversations that I've had with, with a variety of people, a lot of people have said, you know, we feel that this is for us. And I find that really curious in that I, you know, I, I wonder to what extent other artists have been positioned in that way. And of course, I understand that the work that I do is very, is, is about being very sociable, is about bringing people together, is about a kind of, uh, a kind of co- some forms of collective experience. But the winning of the, of the Golden Lion seems to have you know, people said, well, you know, I saw myself in there too. Mm. And, I, you know, I find this re- neither as a, uh, you know, as a high point or as a low point or as a criticism, or, but just as an observation that that is really, I find that really interesting. What does that mean that, you know, suddenly the, the prize just goes outward in a way and, and embraces lots of people and embraces lots of desires, I mm. suppose. Um, but that's, I find that really interesting. Um, uh, and yeah, and I, and I suppose ultimately I do see it as a kind of recognition of a kind of long journey, you could say. Yeah, absolutely. I did wonder if the lagoon was going to flood with the amount of <laughs> tears. tears and water you were adding into I it. Cry, it was such a surprise, I, wasn't it, that moment? I, mean, I cry, I do cry. I'm yeah. a crier. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, but then there was, I mean, there was, there was plenty of reason to cry. Um, I felt it was like, it was okay. It, it's okay in that moment. It was a very positive moment and a really fantastic moment for Britain as well, actually, in terms of having that recognition for the British Council's commissioning and also a very experimental way of working that was not trying to win an award mm. and that was very experimental how we were doing the whole process. Mm. So it was mm. really extraordinary and an absolute delight and everyone is so delighted for you still. So. I, would, I would have loved to have been sitting somewhere very quietly listening to the panel discuss, you know, what because, I, you know, to a certain... I mean, they did read out what the reasons were, but I, I didn't hear any of it, really. Um, just to know what the discussions w- would have been about, because it's also an extraordinary year for the Biennale itself in terms of Chile Ch- Ch- sure. and the, you know, the, so many people came. Uh, and the very little that I have been able to see thus far, you know, the shows are brilliant. Yeah. So it's, it feels like the whole thing has really energised us all, hopefully. Absolutely. It's an extraordinary Biennale this year, and we're very lucky to be part of it, and even more fortunate to have been awarded the Golden Lion for mm. the Great and British Pavilion. And Sonia, it's fantastic to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, yeah. sure. There's a, there is a question already. Yeah. So 
expanded energy coming out from the pavilion, whether that's affected change in the direction of your practice. Um, so I have to confess, and I, I, I've been moaning about this for the last few weeks, I haven't been back into the studio <laughs> since January. Um, and yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot for me to kind of think about, but part of me also wants to park it to the side because I don't want it, I think like a couple of weeks ago, I was feeling suddenly very overwhelmed by, oh, what does this mean? And can I do it? Can I make any work again? Or, you know, all of the anxieties that always come up actually after one puts a show on is that you because you, you need the high and you need that adrenaline to get to the finishing line and then of course there's the kind of drop and I think I was feeling the drop a couple of weeks ago thinking you know who told me I could be an artist I mean this is just ridiculous but you know I'm I'm now really itching to get back into the studio but you know what effect it will have on the work I won't know until I'm in the studio it's, it's not something that I I'm often, I'm often surprised but when I go in the studio what I do because I don't have a, a, a kind of signature of the things that I make because I work with so many different people. So, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm eager to see what happens now. I'm not afraid. So my, my studio is it's, it's very dispersed and um, often itinerant in terms of the fact that I, because I do work with people, but I also work with objects and the relationship between working with people and working with objects. So I've got, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of reorganizing that needs to happen with the devotional collection. I've got hundreds and hundreds of, of, of musical it items. And I have been talking to someone very recently about a particular performer that they, they remember from the late 90s, early 2000s. So this is probably going to be the start of me uh, working around some of those ideas. Um, but I often go out of the studio to organize certain things, to talk to certain people. Even when I get prints done, I don't do it in the studio. I, mean, I, I work on the computer. I mean, it really is quite dispersed. Or, but then I do need studio time in order for things to become still and for me just to sit with things and play with things and play with the materials. Um, so for a, a lot of last year, I was playing with, um, there's a, a mineral called bismuth. Um, and so I was playing with that and I was playing with, I've been playing with glitter quite a lot and um, with words and with, patterns and getting trial prints done so I kind of just need to go back into that it's, it, there's a lot of kind of to and fro that happens in terms of the studio as an expanded sense the studio process you said your work had a very strong social element mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have a particular message that runs through it like a red thread and do you have a particular audience or is it bringing all I tend to bring audiences along. I mean, there are, there are certain things that seem to crop up almost um, fairly regularly, which is a, the, it's a question of a forms, forms of resistance. So if I was going to talk about the, 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 the British Pavilion show, Feeling the Other Way, it, and this is conversations Emma and I were having, that I, I was really adamant that I didn't want it to be an easy listening experience. And it was really important that Sophia Jernberg, who makes these extraordinary abstract sounds, that that there's a kind of there's this there's there's these forms of dissonance within that space, even though there's there's an element of harmony as well. That there's this kind of cutting across the grain that happens in that space. And when I'm bringing people together, I mean, I don't know what will happen often. Um, I mean, some people may know about the Hylas and the Nymphs. Um, performance that took, there were, there were five other performances that took place in Manchester Art Gallery, and I didn't know quite who was going to turn up, and uh, although I had invited a kind of drag family to come and perform, they were extraordinarily brilliant in what, how they then interpreted the space 
of these kind of 19th century galleries and taking the ideas around you know what is gender kind of to a kind of farcical end you might say so it's the bringing together people doesn't necessarily tell me what's going to happen but certain things emerge when 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 people come together and i suppose it's probably to do with who i who i invite and how they how have those people interact and one of the things we talked about and i mentioned briefly earlier was the idea that is a thread a thread from the early depictive work that you were doing that um, many people know quite well, the work that's on paper and how that moves through, is this intimate social encounters and how people navigate different space and encounters together. And some of the freedoms or power plays or status or performativity that comes into that. And so by bringing people together, for example, at Abbey Road Studios with minimal instruction, essentially, other than to explore their voices, there's necessarily then all sorts of games and play, but also interactions that can then be looked at with a kind of curiosity as to what is happening as people live alongside each other or are put into situations or thrown into situations together. And when we've talked before, Sonia, you've said that as reflecting a wider societal experience as well. How are different statuses and understandings of each other navigated? I mean, usually with these, with these um, situations, I'm very aware that people... I, I try not to put people into a situation where they couldn't know what to do. Um, so, you know, a conversation. We all pretty much know the dynamics of a conversation. And, you know, the rules almost of a conversation. So, I, you know, if I invite people to come and talk, I'm, I know that they know how to have a conversation, even if they're conversing with someone that they don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a form that we understand. And so I'm always asking people to do the thing that they know how to do rather than something they don't know how to do, but they're doing it with people that they might not necessarily have met before. And it's that moment of, of thinking about, oh, the stranger and how we might encounter the stranger and then s s very quickly how the stranger becomes very a familiar person because you've had that conversation. And that's really the format. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, do, I mean, I am, I, I'm really very, very aware that, of course, you know, all of those performers that said, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll go on this journey, knew that they might look ridiculous. And it's my job to try not to make them look ridiculous, because that's not my intention. And my intention is not to, not to belittle someone, particularly so publicly. Um, but to find something that is very interesting. So, for instance, Tanita Tikaram, um, the film where we filmed her after um, everybody had done their improvisation together, she had, during Abbey Road Studios, she kind of said, oh, do you mind if we, I do something on the piano? And she literally sat there and made up five songs just like that. And it, honestly, everybody in the room was like, it was jaw-dropping. She doesn't look at the piano at all. She just literally makes up what I think are five perfect songs in the moment. But she had prepared something, and she prepared something for later on. Um, but I used that moment where, and you know, there are moments where you can see she's feeling for the keys. So there's a key that goes slightly off, it goes slightly off and she brings it back. And, you know, that there are these moments where you, you're, it becomes incredibly intimate for us because we're seeing her in her studio 
finding the words, finding the melody, finding the tuning, finding where her fingers need to go, finding her tempo. We are actually, she, she's allowed us into that moment of, of vulnerability, yes, and intimacy. And then her songs are very much about intimacy. So she's kind of allowed us into this extraordinary world that she is able to create. Um, and for me, that is incredibly, that is, that is pure generosity, actually. So only Poppy has seen the entire exhibition. They've all seen the films of themselves and the, and the four part, but seeing it all together where all the sounds are playing at the same time and that it's a, it really is a kind of, it is a kind of sound sculpture of the whole pavilion, but it moves in different places. Um, only Poppy has seen it, and she, she said that she had a fantastic, she thought it was fantastic, and she really enjoyed the experience of the show, as well as the experience of, uh, of, of meeting the performers and performing. And I think I'm supposed to be doing a podcast with her at some point. But she, and, and then uh, Tanita, you know, again, when she first saw the film, she, she thought it was, she thought it was hilarious, actually. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I'm, I'm pleased because they've all seen what they have done and how I've treated the material that they've done, but they haven't seen, not, they've not all seen the, the complete uh, show together. And that's what, that's, I think, um, I, I, I kind of worry, but I, I look forward also to um, when, they, when they get to experience it all together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.